Hi everybody, again, I apologize for being a little late. Uh, you know, um, people have contacted me. They want to discuss, discuss uh, the Jewish perspective on global warming. And you know, I'm not, I'm not an environmental specialist. I will say one thing. I, I remember Yerushalayim in the 1970s that in the summer you had to wear a sweater. And uh, those days are long, long gone. And it's interesting. I mean, that, that itself is at least anecdotal proof that uh, it's getting hotter here. I have no question about it. And this summer is a pretty good, uh, pretty good writer to that. But OK. Uh, our share tonight is dedicated, Refua uh, Shlema, to Braya Bat Chava. And she should have Refua Basok Shachola Yisrael. And Aliyat Neshama for Tzvi Ben Avram Halevi. And Aaron Ben Meshulam, whose yard site is Erev Tishabav. And we also have an anonymous contributor, so uh, Mr. or Mrs. Anonymous, uh, we uh, thank you for sponsoring tonight's class. And then I have an announcement. Uh, Yibana has begun its fundraising drive to raise funds for families in need for the upcoming uh, Yom Yom Tovim. 100% of the money collected goes directly to these recipients. Uh, you can find the link in the YouTube description box. Uh, below or on the Yibonah website, and again, Tiska Lemitzvot, as you know, Yibonah not only has Torah classes, not just mine, but Rabbi Poston and other, Rabbi Kess and other speakers, other Shiorim, uh, but they're also involved very much in uh, Chesed, and uh, we know that particularly at a time of difficulty for Am Yisrael and for the world, uh, the chesed and tzedakah that we do create a great, great tzuchus and shemayim. So I would urge everyone to uh, generously uh, contribute. Um, I wanted to start a little bit, although we generally don't do too much halacha uh, in this uh, shear, I just want to mention just a few halachas because of Tish B'av coming up. And the configuration is a little unusual because the ninth of Av is actually on Shabbos. And we, since we don't fast on Shabbos, except in the case of Yom Kippur, so the fast will be on Sunday, Saturday night and Sunday, uh, the tenth of Av, and that is called a nitcha, pushed off. Now, for most purposes, uh, Nitzchah is like any other fast, you've got to fast, uh, but there are certain leniencies in the laws of Nitzchah. So, for example, particularly if you have a pregnant woman or a nursing woman, normally for Tisha B'Av, they try to hold out unless they have extreme discomfort. Even then, for Tisha B'Av, we will allow it. For a Nitzchah, we are very, very lenient uh, in that, that even if there's a minor discomfort for a pregnant or a nursing woman, uh, we will allow them to eat. But here is the thing. Uh, we know, you know, I remember years ago, I happened to be at somebody's house when we were going from Shabbos to Tisha B'av. And uh, the person was acting too quickly for me to stop him. But the person didn't really figure out how to make Havdalah and everything else. So he literally made Havdalah when Shabbos was over. He says, we will start the Tainus after Havdalah. Uh, so he made rape Priyak oven, he drank the wine, he said, okay, now we have to fast. I mean, unfortunately, uh, that basically meant that he violated the fast from the very first uh, minute. So it's, it is very, very important to understand the sequencing <coughs> of Havdalah uh, in the case of either a Nitzche or when the Ninth of Av is in fact on Sunday, which can sometimes be. Uh, Sunday night, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Saturday night, Saturday night when Shabbos is over, you make no Havdalah whatsoever. However, in order to be allowed to do Malacha, you must either declare Baruch HaMavdil Ben Kodesh Lechol, or if you're davening Mayrev, in the Atoch HaNantanu paragraph, that is the equivalent, that will allow you to do Malacha. Because until you say Baruch HaMavdil, or the Havdalah, in the Shemon Esrei, you're not allowed to do Malacha. After that, the only thing you will do is you will light a Havdalah candle, and you will make a bracha borei maorei ha'esh. Very, very strange. It is the only time that borei maorei ha'esh is made as a freestanding bracha, not connected to Havdalah. Assuming you're not going to eat on Sunday, and I'll talk about what if you are going to eat, Sunday night uh, you will make a Havdalah. Uh, now, what do you make it on? So then there are many, many minhagim. 
Uh, some say that you know, you're not supposed to make it on wine or grape juice, so you would make it either on beer, or some would allow apple juice, orange juice, or even flavored soda. If you do make it on apple juice, orange juice, or flavored soda, instead of beret priyagafen, you must be sure to make shahakol. And then you make the bracha, mavzul ben kodesh l'chol ben ar There's no candle, because you already had the candle motzei Shabbos, and there's also no spices. Okay, it's just the liquid, plus the bracha uh, ha-mavdol ben kodesh l'cho. Now, it's important to know that in the event you have to eat on the 9th of Av, I mean, you have to eat on Sunday. If you do have to eat on Sunday, you are not allowed to eat until you make havdalah, even on Tisha B'Av. So you would actually have to make this havdalah on Tisha B'Av itself. Again, without spices, um, the briskarav would allow grape juice even on Tisha B'Av, okay, but uh, that's a machlokas, but at least on juice or, or, or the like. And you would make Baruch HaMavdol Ben Kodesh Chol. Now, if all you're going to be doing is drinking water, however, because let's assume you have medicine and you need to take water, then you don't make Havdalah for that. You do not have to make Havdalah for water. Uh, but if you're going to have any other liquid or any other, f any food, you would have to make Havdalah even on Tisha B'Av itself. Huh? Uh, on the nitcha, uh, it, it's much more makel too. I mean, not, not everybody agrees with that either, but it's much more makel. Now, one other thing. Uh, normally, when Tisha B'Av is observed on the 9th of Av, there are certain morning restrictions that remain in the 10th of Av as well. And the reason is because Chazal tell us that the Beis HaMikdash was set on fire in the late afternoon of the 9th of Av, and most of the Beis HaMikdash burnt on, on the 10th of Av. Ad Kach, that Rav Yochanan, who lived a few hundred years after the Chorban, remarked that if he would have been in the generation of the Chorban, he would have made the fast on the 10th of Av. What that means is, because of that, essentially, in a normal year, not this year, in a normal year where the 9th of Av is observed on the 9th of Av, as soon as Tisha B'Av is over, essentially you're back into the nine days. No laundry, no bathing, no haircuts, no music, no uh, meat, no wine, until chatzos, until the middle of the day, the next day. Okay, that's how it's normally in a normal year. This year, however, because Sunday night and Monday is not the 10th of Av, it's the 11th of Av. So the going till Chatzos does not apply, but it's a little strange because we do bifurcate things. That does mean Sunday night, Sunday night, right after the fast, uh, after Havdalah, you are allowed to take a bath or a shower, you can do laundry, you can do haircuts uh, and the like, however, Meat and wine, other than the Havdalah wine, meat and wine should not be consumed until the next morning. So it's not chatzos, but it's a slightly strange type of chumra. You don't do it at night, but if you want to have a nice fleshik breakfast, whatever it would be, uh, you can have fleshiks in the morning. And uh, if you drink wine in the morning, uh, <laughs> you can do that. Uh, you can do that as, as well, okay? Now that's only because, now remember, don't confuse this. This is only when the Sunday fast is a nitcha. When the Sunday fast is the ninth of Av, because Shabbos is the eighth of Av, then it's a regular Tisha B'Av, and all of the restrictions will apply until Chatzos of Monday. But since this is a nitcha, you're already past the tenth of Av, so uh, laundry, haircuts, showers, Baths immediately, uh, meat and wine the morning. Now what about listening to music? It's interesting, there seems to be a machlokas if I uh, compare listening to music to the laundry, which is mutter right away, or I compare listening to music to the meat and wine, which is not mutter until the morning. Uh, the savara is logical is it should be treated like the luxury of meat and wine, so I would hold off on music until the, the uh, morning. Okay, but chatzais is not relevant this year because it's in the... Okay, so again, again, I mean, obviously, uh, if you have any shilas, you can either ask me or ask uh, your local or Orthodox rabbi. 
Um, I don't want to get into too many details of halacha, but just be aware of the Havdalah thing, because it's always very clear in my mind. I always have that vivid memory of the guy who made Havdalah right after Tisha B'Av. Uh, and, you know, it's an understandable mistake. I mean, you know, you, you have to figure out, how do I reconcile Havdalah with Tisha B'Av? So the person might say, well, Shabbos isn't over until Havdalah, so I can make Havdalah. But that, that's a very big mistake. Be careful that you do not... Uh, make that mistake. It is important, however, that Saturday night you make a bracha on the candle, and the reason is because the bracha on the candle can only be made Saturday night. I mean, you know, during the year, if I forgot to make Havdalah Saturday night, I can make Havdalah Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, until Tuesday night. But the bracha on fire can only be made Motzei Shabbos, and the reason is because it's not really connected to Havdalah, per se. It's a blessing of gratitude because God gave fire to Adam or, or enabled Adam to discover fire Saturday night after Shabbos. And therefore, every Motzei Shabbos, we give thanks to Hashem for the gift, so to speak, of fire. So you don't have a choice. That, that cannot. If you missed uh, the bracha, Bere Moresh Motzei Shabbos, it cannot be made any other time. So that's why even on Tisha B'Av we make the bracha, Bore Morei Ho'esh, Motzei, Motzei Shabbos. Um, there is, well maybe I won't bring it, uh, there is a bit of a shayla, there are posts that say a woman cannot make Bore Morei Ho'esh. Uh, okay, but Lamai said that Mr. Brewer and other posts seem to say that's all right, so even if a woman is by herself, uh, Motzei Shabbos, she should make the bracha, Bore Morei Ho'esh, okay? So that's kind of the halachic portion of what I wanted to uh, talk, uh, talk about. Um, obviously, uh, this is the Shabbos before, Tisha, before the fast of the ninth, of the ninth of Av, and indeed it is the ninth of Av, the date itself is the ninth of Av. Uh, this Shabbos is given a very special name. It is called Shabbos Chazon, which literally means the Shabbos of vision. And the simple reason why it's called Shabbos Chazon, very, very simple reason, is because the Haftorah, which is the third Haftorah of tragedy, is the first chapter of Sefer Yeshayahu that starts with Chazon Yeshayahu Ben Amotz, the vision of Yeshayahu. So it's called Shabbos Chazon, just like the Shabbos where we read Az Yashir is called Shabbos Shira, etc. Right? So that's the simple reason. Um, it's interesting that Yeshayahu actually lived more than a hundred years before the destruction of the Beis Hamikdash. In fact, Yeshayo lived while there was a Beis Hamikdash, right? There was no Chorban yet. Uh, and most of Yeshayo is giving comfort to B'nai Yisrael in anticipation of the exile. In fact, the seven Haftaris of comfort that we are going to read uh, after Tisha B'Av th until Rosh Hashanah are all taken from the Navi Yeshayo. Yeshayo is called the great prophet of comfort and yet the last Haftarah of tragedy is from Yeshayo. So the simple idea is Shabbos Chazayin just means the Shabbos where we read Chazayin Yeshayo. However, the Svarim HaKadoshim, the Holy Svarim, tell us that there's actually a deeper reason that every, on the Shabbos Chazayin, we should try to visualize in our mind, chazon is visualization, visualize in our mind the idea of what a Beis HaMikdash represents. Because the truth of the matter is, the greatest problem that we face is we really don't understand what it is we don't have. And as a result, we can't really mourn for it because we don't know what it is. You know, it's interesting, there was a Rav who told the story, again, I mean, maybe it's not the nicest story because it's critical of people, but it's a bit of a, you know, it kind of gives you a punch that um, he was a Rav in New York, and he saw, he met some congregants uh, in the street, and they were very, very sad. They were very, it was during the nine days. They were very sad. So he figured, uh, well, Baruch Hashem, these people are taking the Beis HaMikdash very seriously, and he said, I know it's a very sad time, but Hashem will be with us and Hashem will bring Geula and Hashem will bring a Yeshua and we can't give up hope. So they looked at him and they said, well, God didn't really help the Yankees last night. Yeah. Meaning, meaning to say, <laughs> he was making a point. <laughs> they were not even thinking about the base of Mikdash. They were sad because the Yankees, again, I'm not, I'm not sure if my dates are right, uh, but it was something, it was a sports team. 
I guess it's ba baseball season, I don't even remember. Uh, but the sports, uh, sports team was unsuccessful, and that caused them to brach. And it really is the case, and I, I hate to say this, that sometimes we will feel worse about that than the fact that we're in Golos without a Beis HaMikdash. Now again, I don't want to knock people who are sports fans. That happens not to be my Yetzirah. But you know, I have some, whatever, whatever. Everyone has their Yetzirah. The things that make them interest, now that get their interest. And it's an amazing thing. Rev Soloveitchik used to point out a very, very fascinating observation. He pointed out that the, we have what is called private mourning. A person suffers a bereavement. There's a process of mourning. And then there's public mourning, where we mourn publicly as a congregation. We mourn the Chorban, Beis HaMikdash, and the like, right? So one is called Avelis of a Yachid, the Avelis of an individual. The other is called Avelis of the Rabbim, of the Tzibar. Now, so Vedic point, points out that the trajectory of the mournings move in opposite directions. When you have a private Avelis, so how does that work? We start with Shiva, which is very, very strict. For seven days I don't leave my house, right, etc. And then we have Shloshim for 23 more days. Uh, you can go out, but there are different restrictions. And then for most relatives, like a brother or sister, that's the end of it. A wife, husband. But then for a parent, you have an Avelis for up to a year. But that's much more lenient. And then after the year, you're basically free of these restrictions. In other words, Avela starts out very, very tough, very, very rigorous. And it gets progressively lenient as you go through time. With the Avelas over the Beis Hamikdash, we actually find, at least during the weeks of observance of this Avelas, we actually find a reversal of the pattern. We start off with the three weeks. So the three weeks, first of all, for Svartim, there's almost nothing that's observed about the three weeks other than the 17th of Tammuz itself. But let's go with Ashkenazim, right? Ashkenazim, we do have, Ashkenazim have restrictions during the three weeks. So what, you don't get a haircut, you don't listen to music, you don't make weddings. And then we move to the nine days where we don't do laundry and we don't, uh, we don't uh, take baths or showers. And then we move technically into the week of Tisha B'Av, which is actually even stricter. This year there is no week of Tisha B'Av because Tisha B'Av is on a Sunday. But if Tisha B'Av would have been on a Wednesday or something, the Sunday, Monday, Tuesday would be stricter than even the nine days. For example, you wouldn't make a seum on, on meat uh, during that time. And then we have Erev Tisha B'Av. And then we have the crescendo of Avelis, which is Tisha B'Av itself. So if Salvechik points out, when it comes to private mourning, we start out very, very strict and we get progressively relaxed. When it comes to public mourning, we start out very lenient and we get progressively stricter. Why is that so? And he pointed out that the spiritual and psychological functions of the mourning move in opposite directions. When a person suffers a bereavement, their life is often shattered. They often feel unable to connect to the world. They need, as it were, to be in a protected environment. They need people to come to them. They need people to comfort them. Uh, even if, and I will say, even if a relationship was difficult, even if, for example, someone had an abusive parent, someone had a, a parent that it was difficult for them to connect to, you have to understand, they're still totally broken when that parent dies. And the reason is because now they don't have a chance to repair that damage, or at least so they think. Meaning as long as the person was alive, there was always that hope that maybe things might get better. So you'd be amazed. I mean, death of a parent, for example, is very traumatic no matter how difficult the relationship of the child to the parent. By the way, it's even true for spouses. Uh, there's some actually inter interesting psychological research that even when people got divorced, and they've been divorced for many decades, when a former spouse dies, that creates extreme trauma. Um, I've 
I've had occasion to correspond with, with uh, women in that situation. And it's really a situation of the unacknowledged mourner because nobody, nobody figures uh, that she has any relationship to the guy that she was married to 30 years ago. Besides the fact that they may share children, that of course would be amazing. But even if they don't even have kids, so there's nothing connecting them. But there's still you know, something. We, we had a life together and part of my life went away. So the purpose of Avelos is to eventually give a person an inner healing from their devastation so they can eventually rejoin society gradually, a little bit at a time. So after Shiva, we say, now you're ready to go outside your house, but maybe not go to a wedding yet. After Shloshim, at least if it's not for a parent, now you're ready to go to a Simcha. In other words, Avelos is a healing psychological mechanism that enables a person to leave their grief. Now, you, don't, you never leave your grief. One might, perhaps the better word, instead of leaving, is compartmentalization. A loss is always going to be a loss. But initially, it overwhelms you. It, fi it fills every fiber of your being. And at some point, you compartmentalize it so you can smile again, you can laugh again, you can interact again. There'll be something in your heart and in your mind that will have that sadness. But it gets compartmentalized and that's the great bracha of time, the old saying that time heals all wounds is exactly what Chazal say when they talk about Hashem made a chesed, that there's something called shichicha. Now, shikacha doesn't mean we totally forget, but it means that we're no longer emotionally overwhelmed and we could rejoin life because it is God's will that we not become paralyzed by grief and we continue to live. That's God's will. As long as he gave us life, he wants us to live. Now, I remember very, very vividly um, when I first became a, a shul rav in, in Silver Spring, so one of the very, very first events, not, not just first funeral, but almost the first event, was uh, a man who was a Baal Shuva, whose first wife was a non-Jew. And they had a son, and the son converted, and uh, was raised really with the father. And uh, the son died tragically. A young man around 11, 11 years old died, died tragically. And the whole congregation was there to comfort the man who was a member of the congregation. And I still have a vivid, vivid picture in my mind of the woman, the mother, leaving the cemetery alone. Although we, we did comfort her, but she left the cemetery alone while the man was uh, left, left with many, many people who were there to comfort him. And it reinforced to me, number one, the need to obviously be considerate of everyone that suffered the loss, but it also brought in a very, very strong way the remarkable healing nature of the Jewish mourning rituals that a community comes together and they tell a the person, we share your pain. You're not alone. We can't give you an answer why God did certain things, but just know that you're not alone. And when we share your grief, that makes the grief easier to bear. That is why private mourning moves from the strict to the lenient to allow us to get back into the rhythm of life. When it comes to the Chorban Beis HaMikdash, we have the opposite problem. How many people, and I include myself, how many people are so devastated by Chorban, that they can't get out of bed in the morning. Maybe it's a new excuse for high school kids who don't want to go to show. Mm -hmm. You know, Dad, I just can't go. The Chorban Beis Hamikdash is so overwhelming. I mean, it's a joke, right? We, if somebody were to say that, it would be a joke. You know, the generation that experienced the Chorban Beis Hamikdash knew what it was. Some people didn't want to drink wine or eat meat. They said, how can we drink wine at all when we no longer have the wine libations? 
How can we eat meat if we no longer have the korbanos? There were people who said, we cannot do anything. And the rabbis told them that's not the right attitude. Because after all, how can you eat bread if you don't have the lechem upon him? So they said, okay, we'll live on fruit and water. So then they said, well, how can you drink water? You don't have the water libation of sukkahs. So they realized that they have to go back to normal. But we are like blind people. How do you explain color to a person who was born blind, never experienced? How do you explain music to a person who was born deaf? We never had it. Our parents didn't have it. We don't know what it is. And on the other side of the coin, for most of us, most of the time, life is pretty good. You know, most of the time. You know, you have a roof over your head. You have a parnasa, and especially perhaps those who are zocha, to live in Eretz Yisrael and to live in Yerushalayim. And people say, Baruch Hashem, I can go to the Kosel. Or, if you're a little more... Uh, Avant-garde, I can go to the Harabayas. Baruch Hashem. But what is the Kosel? The Kosel is the remnant of the walls that surrounded the Temple Mount. And what is the Harabayas? A place where there's a mosque. And, 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 and the Goyim don't even allow Jews to daven there. So Baruch Hashem, we have something. But it's a something. When you go to the Kosel, side by side with the joy of the merit of going to the Kaisal should actually be a profound sadness of what it is that we don't have. So the purpose of mourning the temple is not to get yourself out of your grief, but to put yourself into your grief. So we start gently, and hopefully through my actions I awaken my emotions. And then I'm ready to feel the power of the grief, which is God's grief, of not having a base of Mikdash. So the purpose of private mourning is to get me out of my sadness. The purpose of public mourning is to get me into my sadness. And that's why it moves in opposite directions. Now, I've already spoken more than once about the idea, though, that grief itself, Dr. Balatanya differentiates between what you might call grief and sadness. He says, sadness, I mean, you can use whatever word you want, I mean, the, the semantics, the actual label is not important, but there are two concepts. Sadness is when a person is paralyzed, they're like a stone, they don't feel. They're so washed out that they don't see any value in life, any purpose in life. Grief is very different. Grief is very alive. You feel. You feel. Certainly Hashem does not want us to be stones. A stone doesn't grow. A stone does not serve Hashem. Hashem wants us not only to serve Him, Hashem wants us to serve Him in joy. But in that joy should also be a feeling of what it is we don't have. And I said many, many times that it is the yearning for redemption that can create a closeness to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, An awareness of distance makes you closer. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. One can become extremely close to HaKadosh Baruch through the Avelas of the Ninth of Av. Because you're crying with the Shekhinah. You're sharing God's grief. Two people, even, who love each other, who are separated by a thousand miles, they can be joined in their heart by the thoughts they have of each other. And there's actually a sense, almost a telepathic communication that people can have at a distance, if not consciously, on a subconscious level of soul-to-soul -soul portal. Tishabav, 
we cry with Hashem. And in that context, we can become very, very close to HaKadosh Baruch. It is the closeness that comes from distance. And the Maral mentions that this is the meaning of the famous Chazal, that Mashiach is born on the 9th of Av. It doesn't have to mean that the person who will be Mashiach, his birthday is on the 9th of Av. Maybe yes, maybe no. But what it means is the messianic power in the world enters the world through the grieving and the sadness of Tisha B'Av. And that is why Tisha B'Av paradoxically, this is so amazing, Tisha B'Av paradoxically is a day that number one, in Eicha, Yirmiyahu calls Tisha B'Av a Moed. Now a Moed literally means an appointed time, so grammatically it could apply to a destructive day and yet we know that normally moed is a happy occasion a chag is called a moed moadim l'simcha so Tisha B'av is called a moed and in the liturgy you will notice we do not recite the Tachanan prayer on Tisha B'av because you don't recite Tachanan on happy days well Okay, fine. <laughs> Tisha B'Av is hardly a happy day. Why do you not recite Tachanun on Tisha B'Av? The answer that's given is, oh, because it's called the Yom Tif. But why would it be called the Yom Tif? Precisely because it's the Yom Tif of feeling my distance from Hashem. And in feeling that my distance, my love and my connection becomes even stronger. Even stronger. And that's why, maybe a funny thing to say, maybe a strange thing to say, but I think it is a true statement. Many, many people, in a sense, enjoy Tisha B'Av. Not enjoy Tisha B'Av for the sorrows that it represents, but it's a time to reflect, a time to think, a time to ask ourselves, what is it? that I need in my life, not, not in, in a personal level, but what does Klal Yisrael need? What does God need? What would redemption be? How would life be different? How could it be? How can it be different? And this is an opportunity. It's a moet, an appointed time, where we can do all of this. So in that sense, Tisha B'Av is a Yom Tif, and it's even reflected in some very, very interesting customs, particularly in Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim has some very ancient Tisha B'Av customs. Some of them actually go back to virtually the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash or shortly thereafter. Not so much the Chorban. The Chorban was in the year 70, but we know in year 135, at the end of the Bar Kokhba revolt, which was catastrophic, and the uh, final crushing of the Bar Kokhba revolt was in the city of Betar, not, not the modern Betar. And it also was on the 9th of Av. 65 years later, on the 9th of Av, the Khurban of Betar, which numerically was even more catastrophic than the Khurban Beis HaMikdash. And even religiously was worse. I mean, losing the Beis HaMikdash is obviously a devastating loss, but the Romans did not destroy the, people don't realize this, the Romans did not destroy the Beis HaMikdash out of hatred for the Jewish religion. The Romans destroyed the Beis HaMikdash as a way of crushing a revolt of some uh, revolutionaries who were trying to fight Rome, and they did so as a political act. And even after the Chorban, Jews were allowed to practice their religion. If you wanted to keep Shabbos, Davin, wear tefillin, eat kosher, have circumcision. The Romans didn't care. They took away your temple. They conquered you. They, they, they subjugated you. You could practice your religion if you want. When we read in the Gemara that the Romans made all sorts of gezeros against Torah learning and Rabbi Akiva was tortured to death because he was teaching Torah, that's in the aftermath of the Bar Kochba revolt where Hadrian decided no more Mr. Nice Guy because this was a second major revolt 
in a little bit more than 50 years. And he was determined to absolutely crush and humiliate the Jewish people. That is when the land of Israel, which had been called Judea, or at least that portion of it, was renamed Palestina, which means the land of the Philistines. There weren't, e there weren't even a nation called the Philistines. They were long extinct, but he wanted to disassociate any Jewish connection. Jerusalem, after Bar Kokhba, after Betar, uh, was Yudin Jews were not allowed to live in Jerusalem, and it became a city dedicated to Jupiter, Alia Capitolina, and the Cardo in, in the old city is kind of a remnant of that. And for more than several hundred years, Jews were not allowed to live in Jerusalem. It was inhabited either by pagans or a little later by Christians. I mean, maybe there were some secret Jews living there, who knows, but it was off limits to Jews. But once a year, the Romans gave permission on the 9th of Av for Jews to circle the walls of the old, not, well, they weren't, they weren't the same walls, but you know, the walls that at that time encircled the old city, again, not the, necessarily the exact same walls, uh, to kind of mourn and grieve. And to this day, to this day, going all the way back to Hadrian, uh, some do have a minog to circle the old city walls on the 9th of Av, either, uh, they, either on the ramparts on top or, or on the ground level, whatever it is. And this is a very old minog. There's another minog that's not quite as old, that the old Yushalmi women would clean their, they would sweep the floors in their home the afternoon of Tisha B'Av to greet the Mashiach that would be coming. It was an affirmation of faith in B'Yas HaMashiach. We have to get the house ready because Mashiach will be coming. And it is a very, very powerful minog as well. You know, I know many of you may have heard of the, uh, the famous Machlis family of Malotafna, my, uh, my uh, next door neighbors. And uh, unfortunately, Rebbe Machlis was, was Nifter a few years ago, and uh, Rabbi Machlis, he should be well, continues their tradition with his family. They, they often host, uh, you know, 100 people on Shabbos, etc. Amazing hospitality. So it's interesting, they have a minute, you know, the, the halacha is, many people, many people don't follow this halacha, that's an interesting question, but you're supposed to leave part of your wall unpainted as a zecher l'chorban. Some people say you could be yotze with a Yerushalayim picture or poster, well, whatever it is, ask your local Orthodox rabbi, but you leave a, a part of your wall, not fully decorated. So in the Machlis home, uh, they have part of a wall, not painted, but they have a um, container of paint and a brush on the floor next to it, so that every time you look at that wall and you see what is not there, you also know that one day we're going to paint it, because there'll be a geula. So even on Tisha B'Av, we think about the geula. In fact, it's very interesting. I'm trying to find the nusach of this. I haven't been able to find it. You know, uh, Tisha B'Av morning until the middle, until Chatzos, we are supposed to recite Kinos, right? The Kinos for our 45 poems, uh, which uh, deal with uh, tragedies and sorrows, lament lamentations, most about the base of Mikdash, but the truth is the Kinos has other things as well. It includes uh, the Crusades, it includes uh, various other massacres of Jewish communities, etc. Uh, some say Kinos even about the Holocaust that were written in recent years by the Baba Rebbe and by Rav Schwab, different, different ones, right? So Kinos are sad, 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 and we're supposed to say them until Chatzos. But now, now the author, Kinos has a few different authors, but the majority of the Kinos are actually written by a single author. And this single author, although he's a very mysterious person, it's so interesting that there's so much we don't know about him, but he is the most famous of the Jewish liturgical poets. And that is Rabbi Elazar HaKalir. Uh, when did he live? Big, big machlokas, but, but basically most say he lived in probably the 7th or 8th century in Eretz Yisrael itself, at a time of great persecutions from the Byzantines. So he lived at a time of great, great persecution, but he was an extremely prolific religious poet. 
For example, a lot of the piyutim we say on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur in the Machsor are from Riyal Azra Kalir. But the truth of the matter is, most of what he wrote for the Siddur we don't say. I mean, he had things for Pesach, Shavuot, Sukkot, the Arba Parshios, uh, all sorts of Shabbos in the middle, every Shabbos of Sfirah Omer. I mean, if you really said all of those pitim that were written, almost every Shabbos of the year, there would be also poems for Ufra of Sfirah, for Chasanas, for Brises, for Pidgin Abens, most of which we don't say. In fact, it's even hard to look to, to find them. There are scholarly editions, there are scholars of Piyutim. And again, I, I myself on Tisha B'Av, I, I give a share, as we're saying, Kinos. Uh, I do an explanatory share, and many other people do it as well. So because of that, instead of 45 Kinos, we do approximately 15 Kinos and try to explain them as we go through it. And again, one needs to know that Kinos are not like Megillah Sester. It's not like it's important that you say every word. In fact, by Kinos, it probably is better to say fewer of them and try to understand what they are. The problem with Rabbi Lazar Khalir generally is he has an extremely obscure style. Number one, grammatically he makes up new words. The Eben Ezra was critical of him for that. But also thematically he alludes to, I mean he has a phenomenal mastery of every medrash, every obscure medrash. And he'll often allude to midrashim with like a word or a letter or something. If you don't know the Medrash, you're not even going to know. Even if you know what the translation of the word is, you're not going to know what he's referring to. So the commentaries are all there unlocking the Midrashic allusions and the like. So Baruch Hashem, there are now some wonderful, wonderful commentaries. I mean, Art Scroll itself uh, has two different editions. They have a regular commentary and then they have a linear. And then they have Kinos from Rav Soloveitchik from Koren. Um, and then in Hebrew, they have wonderful, the, uh, if you know the Masifta Shas, they did a Masifta Kinos, which is quite, quite uh, good. And there's some others as well. So these days, you can actually uh, get a good limut of Kinos. But the reason I'm bringing this up is, it's brought down that Kishem that he wrote 45 Kinos to be said in the morning of Tisha B'Av, he wrote an equal number of nechamot, comfort prayers, to be said in the afternoon of Tisha B'Av. Now these comfort prayers have virtually vanished. I, I, I can't even, I mean, I'm sure you could find them somewhere. I cannot find them. They're not in any collection of kinos. But at one point in time, there was a minog that the afternoon of Tisha B'Av we said Pirke Nechama. Pirke Nechama, because we're, we're thinking about the Geula, right? We're thinking about the, the Geula. So the point is, all of this confirms the central point that Tishabav, Tishabav is a situation of distance, but from the distance we reconstruct a closeness to Hashem that creates a passion that is much more powerful than would have been without that awareness. Now, there is a famous passage in the Talmud Yerushalmi. And the Talmud Yerushalmi says, any generation in which the temple is not rebuilt is as guilty as the generation in which the temple was destroyed. Now, this is an interesting idea that's not intuitively obvious. We might have thought the following. Oh, the generation that lost the Beis HaMikdash, they're guilty of many, many serious Averis. We're not so bad, but we don't have the special merit to get it back. That's what I would have thought. The Talmud Yushalmi is actually making the opposite point. You don't need a special merit to get back the temple. All you need is to rectify the sins for which the temple was destroyed. That's, a, that's actually a chiddush. And what that means, therefore, is the destruction of the temple for X, Y, and Z, whatever the reasons are, is not a past event. But every second we don't have a Beis HaMikdash, we are redestroying it.
We are re-destroying the Beis HaMikdash. So if Chazal say the second Beis HaMikdash was destroyed because of Sinas Chinam, it doesn't just mean the Sinas Chinam of then. It means we're re-destroying it now because of Sinas Chinam. Because if we wouldn't be guilty of Sinas Chinam, we would have it back. Any generation in which the Beis HaMikdash is not rebuilt is guilty of the same factors that caused its chorb. So, Lavish Rebbe used to say, we have to envision that we are setting fire to the Beis HaMikdash itself. We are destroying the Beis HaMikdash every single day. We don't have it. And we also have to realize that this is not just about destroying a beautiful building. You know, I, I say destroying the Beis HaMikdash. You might say, okay, I mean, it was a beautiful building, to be sure. But okay, I have to grieve because a building was destroyed. It's much more than that. The Beis HaMikdash was a symbol of the Divine Presence. So when we talk about Chorban Beis HaMikdash, we're mourning the absence of the intimate relationship with Hashem. And we're trying to feel that void. That's what we're mourning. The Silo Kashchina in the world. You know, the Gemara in Rosh Hashanah describes, although it's describing the first Beis HaMikdash, but it would be a similar process. That God left this earth, or He left the Beis HaMikdash, in ten stages. Each time He stopped waiting and yearning for the Jewish people to do tshuva. The Shekhinah was in the Kodesh HaKadoshim. And it left the Kodesh HaKadoshim into the Heichel, waiting. And it left the Heichel and went on to the altar, waiting. Then it went backwards, back into the Kodesh HaKadoshim. The Medrash says, to kiss his home goodbye. Right, you're evicted from your home, you want to kiss it one more time. And then he's in the courtyard. And then he's on the walls of the, court, of the courtyard. And then he's in the city of Jerusalem. And then he leaves the city and goes to the mountain to the east, which of course is the Mount of Olives. And he casts his last lingering glance at the city that he loves, the people that he loves and goes up to Shemayim. Now, of course, of course, God is still with us. And of course, God still loves us. And of course, God still takes care of us. You know, God didn't disappear. If God disappeared, we would disappear. But whatever it means, and we don't know exactly, this is part of our dilemma. There was a diminution of our ability to connect to Hashem. And Hashem grieves it. And we grieve it. And that, as I say, creates the, creates the closeness. And that is why, through that grieving, we then move to nechama, to comfort, to hope, to resilience. And that's why Tisha B'Av can actually build us up in such a positive, good way. But you have to honestly go through the process. You go through the process of grieving. And that catharsis can be a transformative event in your life. <coughs> so obviously, since the Talmud Yerushalmi says every generation in which the Beis HaMikdash is not rebuilt is guilty of the sins of the Chorban, so our job on Tisha B'Av is also Cheshbon HaNefesh, to think about this. We know, of course, the second temple was destroyed because of hatred, polarization among Jews. In some ways, the fact that this still exists is so obvious that there's almost no reason to even talk about it. Are we guilty of sinas chinam? Is there sinas chinam in Am Yisrael? Of course there is. You have to understand that sinas chinam is not only what you might call red open hatred like throwing rocks although we've had that as well and just within a few months we've had violence within the religious world 
that was virtually unheard of. But you have to understand on a deeper level, sinna is not only what we would call in English hatred, it also refers to coldness, indifference, clickishness. I have my group, and my group is what it, whoever, however I define my group. Sometimes my group might just be me. <laughs> but even if I have a broader definition of my group, we divide the Jewish world into an us and a them. But we have to realize them is us and us is them. And I don't just mean within the religious world where that's actually very, it should be very obvious. But even vis-a-vis -vis a non-religious Jew or more accurately, a not yet religious Jew, right? Walls, barriers. I heard a story that there were two nurseries or two guns that were next to each other, that were separated by an iron fence. There were just two different guns. And one was more Haredi and one was either secular or even Dati Lumi, I don't I remember which one, but of a different orientation, like the Berlin Wall. Now again, the fact that there was a fence, that's not a problem, they're two different properties, I'm not, that, but the story goes that during recess, the kids were communicating through the fence, can't do that. So they put a big black tarp over the fence so the kids could not be able to talk. That's what it is. I'm not even saying which side did it or whatever it would be, but the concept is we'll get poisoned by the other side. Sinas chinam, sinas chinam. But in truth, what's interesting is that it's not just sinas chinam that is the cause for the Chorban, because remember, we have reasons for the destruction of the first base of Mikdash that are still relevant as well. And it says, the first Beis HaMikdash was destroyed because of the cardinal sins of Avodah Zarah, idol worship, Gili Arayas, sexual immorality, Shvichus Damim, murder. Now, how do I connect myself to that? Meaning, I could say the following. All right, Sinas Chinam, you know, okay, I, I, I have what to work on. But Avodah Zarah, Gil Rashi Chazal, I'm not that bad. Meaning, one might think I have no connection to that. And therefore, that type of introspection is irrelevant. Right? I'll, only, I'll think about Sinas Chinam. I won't think about the other stuff. But the truth is, even that would be a mistake. Meaning, we have work to do even on the Avodah Zarah, Gil Rashi let me explain why. I'll give you three really quick reasons why I still have to think about that. Reason number one is that first of all, Chazal have identified many things as akin to idolatry or even murder. So even if I'm not doing the actual activity, I'm connected to those activities via the surrogates. Let me give you two quick examples. Chazal say, for example, that one who exhibits anger is tantamount to Avodah Zarah. So, I am connected to Avodah Zarah if I show anger. Chazal also say, if you humiliate somebody publicly, it is treated as murder. And we spoke uh, two weeks ago, I think, about the power of speech. The Pasuk in Mishle, Hamaves v'hachayim, life and death are in the hands of the tongue. And that's not only physical life, but your words can crush people or give them life and comfort. So in that sense, oh yeah, and, and Gili Arias, I have to say, Chazal say, thoughts of improper sexuality are just as bad as actions. And given the world that we live in, it's almost impossible to escape those various inputs. So to pat ourselves on the back and say, oh, I have nothing to do with Avodah Zorah, Gili Arias, Vichas Damim, is unfortunately not going to be true. We have blood on our hands. We have idolatry in our hands. And we have improper sexuality on our hands as well.
right? So we are connected to these things. So that's reason number one. Reason number two is, you know, this plays into the hands of the anti-Semites, so don't tell them, but it happens to be right, you know, uh, an anti-Semite blames Jews for all the evils of the world. <laughs> well, you know, I hate to say it, but to some degree, uh, they, are, they are correct. I'm meaning to say the spiritual nature of the world depends on Am Yisrael. Now, Rav Yosef Karo, the author of the Shulchan Aruch, was a makubal. He was a mystic. And he had a very good chavrusa. He had a chavrusa of an angel. He learned with an angel. That's called his magit. And he wrote a diary, not, not intended for publication, of his learning with the malach. It's called Magid Meisharim. I think if you go to hebrewbooks.org, you can actually uh, get a copy of it. And in the Magid Meisharim, he tells a fascinating story that he was once learning a difficult sugya in the Gemara, and he could not figure it out. And he worked hard uh, for a very long time, and finally he had a pshat, and it was wonderful. And then he's walking around in Tzfat. If you've been to Tzfat, you can actually, you know, you know the alleyways of the old city that he would be walking. And he overhears a shoemaker, who was not known as such a great Talmud Chacham, learning with his seven-year-old son that same Gemara. Now, he doesn't want to eavesdrop, but he's a little curious. And the seven-year-old asks his father the question that bothered Rav Yosef Cairo for two weeks. Gadol Hador. And the father-in-law was a little impatient at his seven-year-old, seven-year-old, and said to him, I knew this was too hard for you. Why are you asking such a foolish question? The answer is obvious. Coming up with the answer that Rav Yosef Cairo couldn't figure out for two weeks. So Rav Yosef Cairo was heartbroken because he figured if this is so obvious, that the shoemaker is a little upset as his seven-year-old son for not figuring it out. And I couldn't get it. It must be that God is not pleased with me. He withheld basic understanding of me. What is my sin? What is my avera? Why didn't I merit the understanding that even a seven-year-old is expected to have? You can understand his frustration. Well, he had someone to ask. He asked his angel chavrus, What in Shamayim is my sin that I couldn't understand the obvious? And the Malach told him, it's very much the opposite. This was a deep, profound mystery that the world was not deserving of having. But because of your work, and because of your effort, you brought it into the world. And once you brought it into the world, even a kid could get it. But without your effort, it would have been inaccessible. Now that's the story. Now, on a rational level, that story doesn't make sense at all. What do you mean brought it into the world? He didn't write it. He didn't teach it. He didn't explain it. He didn't communicate it to anybody. So in what way did he bring it into the world so that a seven-year-old should be able to get it? The answer is, you see from here, that that is the nature of holiness. A person sits in his room, does mitzvah, stavans with kavana, learns. He brings holiness into the world, and if, that holiness is in the world, it lifts up everybody. The Chavitz Chaim used to say that the intensity of the learning in Raden, a little village in Poland, determined the length of the skirts in Paris. It's like an atom bomb, right? Ground zero, the radiation is most intense. A few hundred miles away, less, right? Uh, you'll have radiation maybe 3,000 miles away. So, in Raden, we have all of this learning. By the time it gets to Paris, maybe they're not learning, but the, the skirts will be a quarter inch lower than they otherwise would have been. This is the ripple effect of Kedusha. What that means is, therefore, if there's Tuma anywhere in the world, 
it's because we did not generate enough Kedusha. So even if I'm not guilty of if I live in a world of which I do, then it becomes part of my responsibility to try to make the world a better place. Now, making the world a better place can have many, many forms. You can be a teacher, you can be a lecturer, you can be a speaker, or, along with that, in your private avodah Hashem, you make the world a better place. The world is differently configured by the kedusha that we bring into the world. So in that sense, we think about avodah zarah, gilarai shvichas the third idea, right, so the first idea I mentioned is that we might be guilty of things like anger, embarrassing people, hirhurim, sexual fantasies. The second is that we do bear an achrayot, a responsibility for the world as a whole. And the third idea is an idea from Rav Sadok, who points out that may be symptoms of character flaws. So even if I'm not guilty of the symptom, I don't have the symptom, I may still have the illness. And he identifies the underlying illness which results in Avaidazara Gilaraish Vikastamim as kina, jealousy, which when taken to an extreme can lead to murder. Taiva, lust for material and sensual pleasure, when taken to an extreme, leads to Gile Arayos. And, he says, Kava, the desire for self-glorification, which can lead to idolatry in the sense of making yourself God. So Rav Tzadok says, in that sense, we still have all of them. And this is what we think about on Tisha B'Av. Because remember that when Hashem first commanded us to build the Beis HaMikdash, Hashem said, make for me a temple so I will dwell within them. The real Beis HaMikdash is in our heart and in our soul. And the way we build the Beis HaMikdash is making our heart and our soul a place for the Shekhinah. And when we do that, Hashem will bring us that Mikdash, Min HaShemayim. So, Be'ezra Hashem, there's still hope, even this week, that uh, we could be Zaycha to the Geula. But if Chas V'Shalom, it's not yet the time, may we pray that this should be the last Tisha B'av. You know, there was a rabbi, they tell us about a rabbi, that every era of Tisha B'av, he would go into a bookstore and buy a new Kinos, Lamentation Prayers. So the owner of the store said, you know, Rabbi, you know, I'm happy to sell you a book. I like to sell books. That's my business. But I know you bought a book last year. And I know you bought a book the year before. And I know you bought a book the year before that. Why do you buy a new book every year? It's the same kinos. So the rabbi said, you think I hold on to a kinos? After Tisha B'av, I have full emunah shalema that this is the last one. So I put it in Seamus. I don't, I don't keep my kinos for next year. If chas v'shalom, I see. That is probably not going to happen. So I got to buy a new one to be able to say the kinos. I admit that most of us are probably not on that madrega. I'm not on that madrega. I have my kinos from, from year to year. But b'ezra Hashem, we should, we should really pray that this will be the last Tisha B'Av of sadness. And all future Tisha B'avs will be days of rejoicing and simcha in the Geula of Hashem. So, be well. Yes, I'm not